Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. We have been following right now live the Christopher Vasado trial in Florida. The defense is currently giving their closing arguments. This is in the penalty phase. You're watching that live right now. So let's take you there and listen. All right, so you have been listening and watching live the defense's closing arguments. This is in the penalty phase for Christopher Vasada's trial in Florida. We have been following this all afternoon here. I want to bring in our guest, Roger P. Foley, a criminal defense attorney. Roger, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Angelica. Nice to see you again. When you listen to this uh, so far, what the defense is saying here, you, if anyone, can give us a good gauge. How is she doing? What do you think? What's your reaction? I think she's doing a good job. She, she's, she's not, I think the word she said was, I'm not telling you this to excuse his behavior, but so you can understand the process of his life, where he was at different stages and what brought him here today. Um, and, and I like that, that, that she said that. She, she's talking, if you notice, her tone is, is very low and, and she's trying to get personable. She's trying to let you understand who the defendant is as a person as opposed to this one particular act of violence that resulted in the death of three people, right? Because if you hear this person killed these three people, most people would say, well, an eye for an eye. So she's trying to explain to you and humanize her client. And I think she's, she's doing a decent job at that. Yeah, and you mentioned her calm tone and all of that. I think that's really actually effective in this. She also had like that list of the people involved and kind of the other characters and how they play into all of this, which I think was also really effective. Um, we know that the judge had already told the jury that there are two decisions here, and that's life in prison or death. So this is sort of her last chance, the last time she gets to let out what she has to say to potentially save uh, Vasada. How do you think she's doing when it comes to that? Well, she doesn't know every juror, and right? she doesn't know how every juror's mind is made up. There are some people who are just inherently against the death penalty, and there's some people who think that idea of an eye for an eye, you know, you, you killed someone, your life should be taken. So she's up against sort of the unknown, and every, every defense attorney on a penalty phase of a death penalty case is up against the same thing. She's taking her time and explaining it. Again, I really like the words. We're not excusing the contact, but conduct, but we're trying to explain to you where he came from. And when, he, when she talks about Juan, right, the, the stepfather who got him into drug dealing, um, I, I think that that gives you an idea. But it, again, it's very difficult. I, I don't know what a jury's going to do. There's no way to get into their mind, but she's doing what she's supposed to be doing as a defense attorney. I don't see anything that, that any glaring holes in what she's doing. Everything she's doing is is textbook and and the she's advocating for her client who's been convicted, you know, of of killing three people. All right, Roger P. Foley, thank you. We will continue to listen to the defense. All right, you watched it live. We have breaking news. We now know that the jury is officially going to be deliberating. So we are, of course, in verdict watch now. This is in Christopher Vasada's trial. The jury has just left the room. This is after that the judge gave instructions, explained what has to happen. He told them if they have questions, they have to write those on paper. He said that evidence will be delivered to the room. He gave his instructions, and we now know that they are off to go deliberate. So that is breaking news here. We will continue to follow this as any new information comes in with Christopher Vasada's trial. Now, I want to bring in our guest right now. We have Roger P. Foley with us today, a criminal defense attorney out of this neck of the woods, actually, down in Florida. Roger. Hey, how you doing, Angelica? So as we listen to the end of the defense's closing arguments, you know, one of the things that was that was made a big deal head of toward the end was this idea of mercy. She went and explained how the greatest power of a juror is to bestow mercy. And she even had a, a big cue card with a, a quote and a line under it of what that exactly means. What do you think of that? Was that effective? Uh, you know, I, I think it is effective. And the reason I think it's effective, Angelica, is because the, the judge talks about a process, right? If there's, if there's an aggravating factor, if you find that it was premeditated, then go to Section B. If Section B, if you find something that there's a yes that you can answer to, then you go to Section C. 
this takes a little bit of that process out and says, hey, people, act with your hearts and act with your minds. People deserve uh, mercy, or, or maybe they don't deserve mercy, but mercy is one of the, the biggest things that we can give to somebody, even if you don't have a reason. And she says that even if you don't have a reason and you think death is appropriate, you can still give mercy. And you hope to have people who believe in God and you and, and believe in, in the Bible or, or whatever their religious affiliation, because in every, whether it's the Quran, the Bible, whatever it may be, there's always a sign of mercy. And you hope that you have some jurors that believe in, in the man upstairs and that they will give mercy because that's the greatest gift we can give. Yeah, she also mentioned how you should value a life. And I think that plays into what you're saying. It's no matter what you think about the death penalty or anything like that, she says, value a life. So I think that was a, a really good, you know, last ditch effort for her to sort of sway a couple of these jurors, maybe. What do you think? I agree with you, and I think that the fact that she showed pictures and showed pictures throughout his life, and when you take the totality of all of those pictures and the circumstances of in his life, is he just a total waste of life, or is it a man who, who, who was involved in a very horrific act where he took the lives of three people, but there's still something of value that he can bring, even if it's in a prison system? Can he guide other people that come in there? What, what, what can he offer? Is a life for a life necessary? Or can they give mercy? And I think that the fact that the defense showed those pictures and showed his life and showed the, what got him there, what, what brought him to this path, it shows that he didn't have the best life. He didn't have the best family. He didn't have the best circumstances. And, and maybe anyone in that situation could arrive there. Maybe they couldn't. But if you think that other people in the same situation that he grew up in could arrive at this same point. Maybe you give him mercy. Maybe you give him life. Remember, it's life without the possibility of parole. We're talking he's going to die one way or another. Is it going to be natural causes in a prison, or is he going to is he going to you know be terminated by whatever means you know through uh, chemical means? And the judge laid out the aggravating factors earlier. Um, I, I can go through those if you want. But basically, when he does that and when jurors have to take those into consideration, walk us through what, that, what happens and what goes through a juror's mind during that for those of us who are unsure of that exact part of this. Well, I, I've never been a, been a juror in this situation, so it's a little bit of, of an educated guess. But I think it's extremely difficult for, for a jury. I anticipate that we're not going to have a verdict today. I mean, it, it's it's 226 in the afternoon. Are they gonna be done in three hours? I mean, they're talking about the taking of a life. Yes, lives were taken. And some people, I'm sure if you're, you know, if, if you're looking at people that are tweeting and, and talking about the case, oh, he needs to be executed. But when you're making the decision, I can't imagine a more difficult decision than to determine whether or not you're going to say yes to the taking of another life. I think it's extremely difficult for jurors. And I, I'm thinking that there's jurors in the back going, why did I get picked to do this? Like, this isn't what I wanted to get signed up for, but this is the duty of a juror in this type of case. Right, because that was going to weigh on them, too, for their life. Absolutely. I mean, you're, if, you, if everyone says yes, then the judge is going to most likely, doesn't have to, but more than likely is going to go with what the jury said and he's going to he's going to sentence him to death. And then, yes, there's appeals and there's process. But more than likely, you have to assume that death will eventually come um, unless there's an appellate reason to overturn the decision. All right, Roger, thank you. We have to take a break, but stay with us. We have plenty more on this when we come back.